a 30 year career, I have to say, uh, a bit sheepishly. Um, I started uh, in 1990 with uh, Citibank um, and I was in the institutional banking group of Citibank in Malaysia um, as a risk manager. I was in the risk management department. I was there for about three years. And then I moved on in 1993 into the investment industry. Um, I was an analyst in the company called Seacorp Schroeder. Uh, capital management. It was a joint venture between C Corp, which was a subsidiary of PNB, and Schroeder Investment Management in the UK. So, so I stayed there in total for about 14 years, uh, which included also two years of secondment to Schroeder's in the UK um, to manage uh, Asia Pacific uh, portfolios, to help the team manage Asia Pacific portfolios. And uh, I suppose. During the 14 years, there were also changes uh, within that organization. Uh, Schroeder's uh, sold their stake uh, just before the Asian financial crisis. So it became a wholly owned subsidiary of uh, PNB. And, uh, you know, I stayed on. Um, I joined as an analyst. Then I was, uh, you know, I became a fund manager after coming back from the UK stint. And uh, by the time I left, I was uh, CEO of the organization. And that was in 2017. Sorry, uh, 2007. Sorry, I tried to accelerate my career. <laughs> so in 2007, uh, I moved on to uh, Ivy Cap Management. Uh, as it was a startup at the time, uh, an Islamic fund management company which was uh, under the value cap group. Um, I think many, many of you would know that. And um, you know, I helped to, to sort of operationalize the fund management company. Um, and we were also the manager of the first uh, Islamic ETF in Asia. And uh, at that time, the largest ETF in the world. Uh, Islamic ETF in the world, sorry. Um, so that uh, was a, a three year stint um, in uh, IV cap. And then I move on to uh, CICOP, uh, to, to SC, sorry, uh, in early 2011. So I've been here uh, since then. Um, and, uh, you know, time flies when you're having fun, as they say. Interesting. <laughs> um, and Dato, um, I think we realized that you, you started pursuing CFA after being in the industry for a while, right? What yeah. motivated you at a point in time? Well, to be brutally honest, uh, Justin, um, I took the CFA exam because I was required to. <laughs> uh, this was when I, when I joined CCOP Schroeder at the time. Um, Schroeder being an international fund management company, I think they had uh, sort of recognized the value of the CFA uh, designation, uh, CFA qualification. So for, for all uh, you know, investment personnel on the Schroeder's uh, in the region, we were required to take the CFA exam. So that's how I actually you know, uh, started, uh, you know, getting more familiar with what the CFA program was all about. So I, I sat for the exams uh, and I eventually uh, got my charter in uh, 1997. So uh, many, many years ago, uh, at the time, uh, you know, modules like derivatives was a very small portion of the exam, which was why I, I guess I, I couldn't get through the exam at the time. Um, but I suppose, um, you know, from, from that then on, uh, it was more of, uh, you know, the, the combination of the work as well as, you know, the, the qualification, um, you know, helping to, to help to helping me to sort of uh, move on in my career. Great. Good to know that, that Dato. Um, Carol, if you can move on to the next slide. All right, everyone, I think to, to make sure that we have a fruitful discussions and forum today, I think we have um, trying to anchor the discussions today into five key a areas here. As we put on the, the lens of the few future, I think we cannot avoid by looking at each of the key p pillars here. Um, number one is our outlook, right? Trying to look into some of the key highlights in 2019. What did we achieve? And where are we going from, from there? Second one is the digital, 
All right. Um, I think when it comes to digital narrations, it's a, it will create a lot of excitement, right? I think when it comes to digital, it's, it's always about creating accessibility to, to some of the in investor, also providing some alternative ch channel uh, for ambitious or eager investor to make a bit more re return. The third one is really about sustainability. Right, as we are now in the COVID-19 years, um, the world is get, getting less sustainable. Let's, let's look into some of the directions that you know, the SC and the con country is take, taking when it comes to sustainability, when it comes to ESG, when it comes to SRI, Islamic finance. I think each of them will play a certain part as well. The fourth one is about efficiency, right? Very, very important issues for the in industry as the margin is getting compressed. How could we con con continue our business in the cap capital mar market by protecting, uh, by improving efficiency with, with, with a goal to pro protect the margin of the business as well? The fifth one, very, very critical for, for the na nations and industries are around accountability, right? How are we holding some of the firm accountable and individual accountable to some of the ac actions done that is harmful to the in industry, right? So this, this sort of sum, sum up some of the key pillars that we will go through for discussions today, right? Um, okay. Let's look into number one, right? The outlook, right? Um, and that when you look at some of the achievements that we have done, I think despite that it was a challenging year, I think we, we come a long way as well, right? The total capital market grew by 3%, primarily driven by Islamic cap capital mar market, right? I personally know that ICM, I mean, you're a strong advocate of ICM as well, right? The second yeah. one is around, um, we saw an overall decline in equity fund raise, raise, raising, but the IPO case cases have uh, re rebounded significantly, right? Um, so man, many things were achieved in year 2019, Dato. Any personal reflections and feedback to, to some of the statistics that we are reading on the slide? Well, uh, I suppose just in 2019 uh, was a tough year uh, when we went through it, uh, and now we realize 2020 was is an even tougher year for for many of us, uh, not just in Malaysia but globally. But uh, just uh, picking up on your question on 2019, you know, SC has a dual mandate, as uh, many of you would know. We are responsible for both developing as well as regulating the capital market. So in uh, doing so, uh, you know, we have to balance because uh, sometimes you know, what we want to do on the developmental side, uh, we need to ensure that, you know, it's properly regulated as well. And we do adopt a general philosophy of proportionality in our regulation. So in this regard, uh, you know, in 2019, we continued with uh, some of the initiatives that we had uh, began earlier. For example, our digitization uh, efforts, our uh, you know ICM, uh, as you mentioned, uh, as a market leader, we continue to have to ensure we retain our competitive advantage, and this is coupled with our expansion into the SRI space, sustainable responsible investment space. And I think one other area that we did look at uh, quite closely uh, last year was to broaden the alternative financing. Uh, Avenue. Right? So we have, uh, you know, in tandem with our digitization efforts, as you know, uh, earlier on, we introduced the framework for equity crowdfunding, peer-to-peer um, -peer financing, and we also have the um, you know, digital investment management framework. So the, some of these things, uh, you know, apart from supporting the digitization efforts, uh, the ECF and P2P framework in particular help to broaden uh, access to financing uh, through the capital market. So we are helping, uh, you know, in our mind, helping the, the smaller, you know, the MSMEs also to tap on financing. Uh, some of these uh, startups and new companies may not be bankable or, you know, uh, may not have access to the traditional financing. So uh, we felt that it was the role of the capital market to, to bro broaden and provide uh, that access. So I suppose, yeah, uh, yeah sorry. Uh, no, I, maybe I, I just could uh, wrap up uh, on, on, on this point uh, or to, to, to your initial question. 
I guess, uh, you know, personally, uh, I, you know, with all these things uh, on the plate in 2019, it was a very busy year for us. But I guess one of the things uh, you did mention about my passion for, for ICM and SRI, uh, we did launch uh, towards the end of 2019, the SRI roadmap for the Malaysian capital market. So that was one of the was, uh, deliverables for the SE during the year. Uh, among the few other deliverables. Great. Um, and Dato, I think now we are in August. I think the first, the first half of the year has passed very quick, quickly we, without us realizing, especially in MCO period, right? Yeah. Um, how would you see the second half to turn out to be, right? And if industry is counting on SC in navigating us through the second half of, of, of the year, what are the, first, what are the few things that we should be doing? Well, um, I think the second half will be equally difficult and challenging uh, for many of us. Um, I think there is still a lot of uncertainty. Um, when you talk just about COVID, no one knows uh, when you know, uh, we will have uh, more stability. And, and you know, we did go through a period of single digit new cases. Now, uh, you know, it's, it's a bit more fluctuating uh, in terms of the number of new cases. So. Um, it is still uncertain in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of uh, the MCO or now our MCO, uh, to what extent uh, this will be extended uh, post uh, 31st August. Uh, so with that uh, sort of uncertainty in the background, coupled with uh, some of the external events, um, you know, sort of global, global economy, uh, some geopolitical issues, um, I think we we are certainly going to have a, a, a volatile, I would say, a volatile second half of the year, um, which uh, does not necessarily be a you know bad thing from an overall perspective. And there's, there's opportunities always in the volatility, uh, market volatility, but uh, I think we do need to keep uh, a close watch on corporate earnings. For example, we are looking at the equity market. Uh, whether earnings, we know earnings have been affected, uh, but we are not sure at this stage how badly earnings are, are being affected. Uh, earnings uh, season will be coming in quite shortly for for second quarter, and I think we, you know, we will be, uh, you know, analyzing or observing uh, very closely uh, some of the results that the corporates will be releasing. So this would uh, tie in, I suppose, you know, uh, as this is a CFA uh, society event, a webinar, uh, we tie it back to, you know, as a role of analysts in um, analyzing uh, corporate earnings and also market valuations. So this is where I think, you know, we, we do need to have, um, you know, the, the, the ability to, ensure that assessments are based on rational uh, arguments you know there is rational basis for for analyst forecasts and also for expectations of uh, market or corporate performance uh, moving away from corporates uh, we are we also recognize from operational perspective you know capital market in intermediaries uh, are facing challenges in uh, running the operations so even through the MCO period, we had uh, extended some of the deadlines for regulatory submissions, for example, and the PLCs were also allowed to, to have some uh, sort of leeway in terms of the submission of the annual reports of, and results. So the, these are some of the things that uh, had been done. But I suppose to, to sort of capture in, in broad sense what we're trying to do, one is we want to ensure that the capital market continue to operate in a... Uh, in, in an orderly manner. Uh, secondly, we want to also provide a facilitative environment for those uh, you know, businesses and also investors and stakeholders who are facing challenges in the current uh, COVID environment. And thirdly, is to actually uh, roll out some of the, maybe in you know, for lack of a better word, the lower hanging fruit in terms of opportunities to uh, enable uh, market participants in the capital market. Right. Right. 
Um, moving along, that, that tie very closely to the next topic that we're discussing, Dato. Uh, if you can go to the next, next slide, right? Because we talk about COVID-19 poses various challenges to us, right? Um, and, and look at some of the achievements that we have come a long way when it comes to equity crowdfunding as well as P2P, right? Um, on a combined basis now, I think we have about 21 op operators in Malaysia. I think we bordered about uh, five P2P lenders as well as three um, equity crowdfund fund, funding operators, right? And look at some of these statistics here are quite encouraging. Um, last year alone, I think we, we granted up to 700 mi million of our financing to about 2,000 micro SME, right? And think about times like, like this. Micro SMEs are commonly known as the underserved and unbanked seg segment because a lot of financial intermediaries will find them very expensive to serve them, to provide them the right fin fin financing. And this financing platform that we have here, the ECF and P2B come in very handy, right? Yeah. Um, and Dato, I think if you look at some of these achievements, are you, are you happy with it? What 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 is your what is your vision? How we can take it to the next level? Level. Well, um, I think I you know I touched on this briefly just now. I think uh, you know the development of the MSMEs is very important for the Malaysian economy. I think they account for over ninety percent in terms of the number of uh, you know businesses that are in this segment. So. Uh, you know, for us, uh, you know, the ability for these companies to have access to financing is extremely important. Um, uh, the response to the both the ECF and the P two P initiative uh, was actually encouraging. Um, we we have now actually ten uh, ECF operators, eleven P two P operators, um, as uh, reflected on the screen. So, uh, and I think not only are we a, providing access to financing for the MSMEs. We are actually encouraging greater uh, innovation, uh, entrepreneurism, entrepreneurship uh, among uh, the Malaysians, right? Um, for those who have ideas, as you say, some of them are underserved or they are you know, unbankable uh, ventures. But uh, these platforms have enabled them to have access to, uh, to start the businesses or expand their businesses at the initial stages. Then uh, I think we, we should also look at these um, initiatives from the investor perspective also, in the sense that uh, a lot of, uh, or, or rather the majority of the investors in the ECR and P2P uh, projects are actually those below the age of 35. So, uh, so we are attracting the younger, I suppose, pool of uh, investors uh, into the market. Um, I think we look at the numbers uh, earlier on, I, I suppose, you know, prior to the recent, the last few months where we did see, you know, heightened activities in the stock market. But prior to that, we actually have uh, witnessed that, uh, you know, the stock market participation among the younger uh, population had actually been relatively low. Uh, prior to the last few months. So I think this is uh, where we thought you know, uh, there's, there's alternative uh, opportunity for them to invest uh, their money uh, into something that is uh, different. Uh, is a, it also requires lower ticket and it's a lower investment amount, uh, minimum amount required to invest in some of these projects. And uh, I guess to, in a lot of ways, the projects that they fund are closer to, to their interests or their, their passion. Right? So that uh, it creates a completely new opportunity, both for the issuers or the businesses, as well as for the investors. Mm. And uh, maybe if I could just add on, uh, since we are talking about uh, you know, the digital, I think, uh, you know, over the last few years, we have been uh, putting in a lot of initiatives and efforts towards growing uh, digitization um, in opportunities in the capital market. 
And uh, we have the digital investment management framework as well, as I mentioned earlier. That's and right. we do have a few uh, operating in that space. So again, uh, you know, the relatively low cost uh, sort of fee the, uh, for digital investment management uh, and the ease of actually, you know, uh, for investors to sign up and be a, an in investor, again, opens up a, a new avenue, a new channel for investment management. Yep, yep. I think not forgetting, I think the the digital asset exchanger as well. I think SE has yes. grant, grant, granted three li licenses so, so far when it comes to cryptocurrency um, tra tradings activities, right? Thank you. Yes, that, that, you're right. Just in the, the three operators now uh, on the, our DEX, uh, Digital Asset Exchange. And I think very recently, we have also uh, sort of issued a press release to invite uh, feedback from the industry and the market on a framework for digital asset wallet providers. So that's yep. another area where you know, uh, within the di digitization space that we are embarking on. Kudos, kudos to SE. Um, and and, that, and that too, I think some of the question coming from, from the floor is um, if I could set a con context around it, right? Some of the P2P lenders that we are looking to, I personally look into some, some of them. I think, they, I think the past return has been quite prom promising, right? Generating about 8, 10, 12%, right? By keeping mm -hmm. their um, MPL pretty low, right? 3, 2%, 3%, the sort of M MPL rate. And he, they, 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 they come out some um, creative and innovation ways to diversify, you know, because they are dealing with some of, most of them are dealing with micro SME, right? So some, some form yeah. of diversification is there to keep the MPL rate a bit lower as well, right? Um, and you rightly point, pointed out that um, this sort of scheme or this sort of platform tend to attract young investors, right? Because... Yes. I think the market or the participants or the investors is increasingly concerned about the reliability, right? As we talk about the digital investment managers, we talk about ECF, we talk about P2P lender, we talk about digital asset exchanger. Um, I mean, what sort of trust or how reliable are these operator, right? I think the, con the context is it all, all these operators are regulators and supervised by SE, right? What sort of com comfort that we are getting that these operators are working well? Well, I think before we uh, you know, give licenses or, or you know, allow these operators to operate, uh, they have to meet uh, you know, the requirements that we have set. And the requirements are actually you know, based on our you know, assessment of the risks associated with such uh, businesses or such operation, operators. And uh, it's also uh, in many cases based on feedback that we get from the industry uh, and also our assessment of you know, our benchmarking against uh, other regulators in other jurisdictions where available. But I think um, having said that, uh, I think you, you would know Justin that in, in, in this area in digitization, Malaysia is actually one of yep. the forefront at the forefront in, in, in many of this framework, regulatory framework. So, uh, you know, we, we are in, in a way sort of the, you know, going into this uh, green, sort of a green field area for us, uh, you know, trying to ensure that our framework and, and regulatory requirements uh, fit for purpose. So the, I think, Having said that, then you know during the sort of application stages for these various operators, uh, you know we go through uh, extensive uh, you know engagements to make sure that they are ready. Uh, we identify a few broad areas where uh, you know they need to meet certain minimum requirements, and if they do meet the, when they do meet the requirements, then you know we provide them the license. So I guess. The comfort, or you know, uh, the comfort is from the SE process that we undertake, and uh, again, you know, for us, uh, ensuring investors are protected is uh, paramount. That's one of our key uh, prior, you know, uh, mandates uh, as a regulator. So on that basis, I, I would say you know, that we we would 
tend to err on on more on the conservative side if uh, if you know if we need to. Uh, so and and then in in this case where you know regulatory benchmarking, as I mentioned, is not as as available. Uh, we then try to make necessary adjustments as we go along once we have more experience in some of these areas. Uh, and one example I could just quote very quickly is uh, in terms of ECF. You know, we started out uh, having a cap of 5 million ringgit in terms of the maximum amount a company can raise through the ECF platform. Now, uh, you know, having had the experience and looking at the risk uh, framework, we have increased that to 10 million. So we are doing this gradually uh, in areas uh, in, in where we may not have the full experience, but uh, I think that's where, I suppose, responding to your question, the comfort comes in. Yep, I can I can appreciate a bit more based on today's discussion. I mean, it's in COVID nineteen world we always talk about the trade off between life and livelihood, right? In a, and you shared that 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 the two roles that SE is playing, right? Yeah. Um, now we are coming to this is really the trade off between how innovative you want the market to to be versus how safe are those, right? You yes. can is ultimately it's a balancing game, right? Right, everyone. Yeah. I mean, you are trying to be innovative at the same time. You want to make sure that the investor are protected, right? So yes. thanks, thanks for doing that. All right. So moving along, well, I think to the yeah, yeah. So I think this will be something that close to your heart, Dato. Right. So SRI and Sukut. Right. So I think we are. Um, Malaysia is a pioneer when it comes to Islamic fine finance, and we are in a very interesting position now. Um, around what is good, what, what are the investments that are socially responsible and what are those uh, suk, sukut, right? Is Sharia com, compliance uh, per se, right? Yeah. So now we have a lot. I, I think the SRS sukut issuance is amounted up to 5 B, B, B billion now, right? Which is very size, sizable. How do you personally see the interplay between the two? Islamic finance and SRI, right? Are, are they... Are they Overlaps, or um, how do you see that? Well, uh, certainly, I would say that there are overlaps and significant overlap as well, Justin. Um, if we look at the underlying principles of uh, sustainable finance vis a vis Islamic finance, there are a lot of uh, common objectives and common features between the two. And this actually explains why we really embark on developing the SRI ecosystem for the Malaysian capital market all the way back to 2014, right? When we introduced the SRI Sukuk framework, that was the, our first formal framework and uh, that combined both SRI and Islamic finance uh, represented by Sukuk. Um, we, we believe that because of the similarities, uh, it, Malaysia is, was, is still in a good position uh, to harness the, our strength in Islamic capital market, uh, to also propagate the sustainability agenda. And uh, we had been uh, you know, embarking on this, as I said, since 2014, and then you know, we had a few issuances under the SRI Suku framework since then. Uh, we started with, I think some of you will know, one of the Kazana issuance for the education uh, in a trust school purpose. And then we had a few uh, green sukuk issuances, including the world's first uh, green sukuk in 2017. And uh, we also introduced the SRI fund guidelines uh, at the end of 2017. Uh, we also have Islamic Fund and Wealth Management Blueprint in 2017, which also make references to sustainable and responsible investing. Uh, you know, um, so the, for, for the SC, you know, we recognize the, 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 there are similarities and we actually uh, say we have acted on, on this recognition of the similarities. And you can see that uh, many of the initiatives that we undertake for ICM, or Islamic Capital Market, uh, we also uh, now over the last few years incorporate the SRI element into it. 
Yeah. And I think the opportunities are great for us. Um, as you have put there, uh, the sustainable development goals of the UN, United Nations, uh, on the screen. I think this actually uh, provides substantial opportunity for uh, Islamic capital market to play a role. Uh, I think, first of all, if we look at the amount of uh, funding required, it's about five to seven trillion US dollars per annum for the mm. world to achieve the SDG goals, the 17 SDG goals. And, um, no, and about half of this uh, would be required in the emerging or developing economies. And uh, many of these developing economies are also uh, members of the OIC countries, uh, in, uh, Islamic uh, organization countries. Having said that, uh, you know, the Islamic finance, just to clear the air, it's not just for Muslims, it's not just for Islamic countries or economies, it's for everybody. And this is where we try to, uh, Malaysia, uh, try to position uh, ourselves as uh, providing solutions capital market solutions for both SRI and Islamic capital market. Great, great. And Dato, I think just, just curious on, on that note, right? Are we the only one in the world that having um, SRI Suku? I mean, we are certainly the pioneer. Are, are you aware that which other, other countries are also doing the same? Well, in terms of SRI Suku framework, I think that uh, we, we are probably the only one as far as I am, I'm aware. Um, there are Sukuk issuances in other markets that support sustainability uh, in agenda, but uh, these are not sort of, uh, you know, labeled as SRI Sukuk the way that we have. I think for us, I think this is important um, you know, to, to create greater awareness of the opportunities that Islamic capital market provide in the sustainable finance space. Um, because I mean, and a bond is a bond, a suku is a suku, right? Uh, right. But if you label it as such, uh, then you know there is greater awareness of what uh, are the opportunities specific to you know promoting the sustainable development goals uh, that Islamic capital market can play. Sure, and not forgetting, I think I think um, HSBC Amana in Malaysia issued the world first SDG Sukut as well, right? I think that was that was a while ago. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Right. I think so. I think we I think we have done a lot in terms of uh, pushing that, pushing this agenda moving for, for forward, right? And I think for the benefit yeah, of all, I think there's many more things that we can do, though, Justin. And we are we are continuing to engage with uh, all the stakeholders. Uh, in the ecosystem uh, to, to have more innovation and you know, uh, greater advancement thought leadership in this space. Sure, sure, certainly. And Dato, I think just, just to share from, from CFA Society in Malaysia pers perspective, we are, we are currently part of the Malaysia Sustainable fin fin Finance Working Group chaired by Tan Sri Awad Wahid Om, Om, Omar, right? So one of the agenda we're trying to put forward for 2020 is for Malaysia to issue the world first um, sovereign sukut, um, wrap it around as, as some of this SDG go, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So we start to see a lot of tractions when it comes to that. I think we are met up with the finance minister. We also met up with some of the agency in EPU, right? In an official tweet by a finance minister, he said, I think, I think it, it, it coined around the discussions as such as um, infusing sustainability in the budget preparations. So I think, um, I think as far as CFA Society in Malaysia, I think that's the direction we're trying to move as well. We, we're trying to urge everyone in, in, in moving to that sort of directions. All right. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Moving along, I think the second slide, I think we talk about so SRI is something that is in a way unique. Um, I just want to call it out some of the eligible SRI project as per SE frame framework, right? I think at the top of it, you see all the green pro, pro, pro project. At the bottom of it, I think we see a lot of social, so socially responsible pro project. And WACAF is, uh, work, work half around the WACAF asset and property is potentially very u, u, unique as well to, yes. to Malaysia, right? I just yes. want to call out the socially responsible investment Right, you know, if I if I look at some of the word wording here, some uh, some of the eligible project about affordable housing, employment generations, 
access to essential serve, serve services, basic infrastructure that's affordable to all, and food security and stuff like that, right? Um, yeah. In the COVID-19 years at 2020, do you see more tractions um, when it comes to um, so socially responsible in, in investment? Yeah. Well, I think overall, uh, globally, uh, Justin, I think we, we are seeing this, uh, you know, sort of increased interest and, and not just interest, but a real need for social finance. And, you know, the, some of the social-based projects that's highlighted in blue on the screen uh, would be uh, in a, a, some of the areas that would require funding. Um, in the Malaysian context, I think we, there have been engagements uh, from what we understand um, among some of the potential issuers for one or two of these specific areas that, that you mentioned. And I think we, for us as the, the regulator and also you know, providing uh, support in market development, we try to facilitate as much as we can. But I think at this stage, uh, you know, given some of the challenges in terms of uh, you know, going specifically into the type of fundraising channels that can, uh, you know, that's possible at this stage, I think you know, some of these conversations are still ongoing. Right. Um, and I think it may be too uh, early for to to be shared. Uh, I think in terms of uh, the possibilities. Understood, because I think from maybe a society perspective, or industry pers perspective, I think we need those funding channeling to the right source around house housing income and em employment gen generation more than before, right? Right. Yes. To, to to provide the livelihood to to all to 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 cope with the challenging years. True, true. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, I think the next one is, um, is around efficiency. Dato, if you don't, don't mind, I think some part of our industry is uh, dinosaur industry because we existed for the longest time, right? Especially the, the brokerage in, in industry. And over the past years, We've seen that the brokerage industry has has is is going through some form of consolidation, right? I think um, yeah. the time has not been easy for them as well. I think there are pricing challenges, margin challenges. They are asked to cope with more stringent reg regulations, and we we expecting the industry to continue to be consolidating. Um, but at the same time, we start to see some niche player getting into the mark market. Um, I mean, some of the niche players are more specialized in providing um, niche differentiated services. I think those, those, those players seem to be in good shape, right? Um, so we, we actually come across this uh, digitalization group, right, with the name of Bridge, um, formed by SC, with an aim to help the brokerage industry. Could, yeah. could, could you share, share with us some of the, some of the, some of the insights, you know, um, what is this working group for and what is this working group trying to achieve? Yeah, okay. Well, actually, um, uh, you picked this up from our 2019 annual report, I believe, but uh, actually the bridge initiative started in 2018, uh, Justin. Right. And uh, as you can see from, uh, you know, on the screen, there are three key uh, sort of objectives that we try to achieve through this bridge uh, initiative which is uh, one is, uh, or rather three focus areas. One is on digital onboarding. Uh, second is on post-trade and settlement. And the third on corporate actions, right? Uh, so e-corporate actions. Um, and uh, in doing so, we actually uh, sort of convene all, all the relevant, almost, you know, the relevant stakeholders or their representatives. So we do have our, uh, you know, fellow regulator Ben Nagara here, our, uh, the exchange where Bursa, we have the industry associations, as well as uh, some of the brokers uh, directly uh, being part of this uh, digitization working group. And, and we also have service providers um, in, uh, that offer so like corporate action services and all those uh, as part of uh, the, the group. So in essence, uh, the, the objective is to accelerate the digitization of the stockbroking industry in Malaysia. And in so doing, uh, you know, going back to your earlier point, uh, we do, we, you know, one of the intention is that such digitization will, one, create more opportunities 
uh, enhance efficiency and therefore we you know enhance uh, the profitability of uh, of the stockbroking industry through you know, more digitization or cost cost effective digitization so some of the progress that have been achieved um, again in the some of this you can see on the slide as well is uh, you know in terms of onboarding uh, you know being fully digitalized onboarding in terms of account opening including cds account opening which has been facilitated by bursa and we also have uh, we're working on higher online settlement uh, so that uh, you know a higher amount can be uh, settled online um, and also uh, adoption of uh, you know the e-contract notes and e-statements uh, in, in this case we well, one of the initiatives is to require uh, new uh, investors as well as those trading online online investors uh, to provide the email addresses as a requirement so that uh, we can be, it can be totally uh, you know e or digital experience for them throughout um, yep. so this is actually what uh, you know so in, in a nutshell what uh, the bridge uh, is but maybe on, on the same along the same line i just want to highlight in 2019 uh, we also set up the fund management digitization group uh, along the same uh, objective where you know we want to enhance the the digitization of the fund management industry so this is uh, uh, this, this was initiated in 2019 so some initiatives are still ongoing and uh, among the areas that uh, the that fund management digitization group looking at is also in terms of client onboarding as well as the provision of digital fund management services uh, and to, you know, to enhance efficiency. Mm. Great. And when it comes to digital adoptions, I think it's something that we need more than before, right? Especially yes. during this M MCO uh, time. Exactly. Right. I think, well, thanks, thanks for bringing that up. Because uh, I think, you know, when, when we started this out, obviously, you know, in 2018, we didn't anticipate uh, the COVID to <laughs> take place. But on hindsight, you know, given all the, you know, all the initiatives and that have been put in, uh, the stockbroking industry and and you know other parts of the capital market, because of the digitization agenda that we have pursued, have been actually been in a much readier position uh, than they would have been uh, right. to face mm -hmm. COVID nineteen uh, and the end period. Uh, you know, um, and therefore the capital market was able to continue operating pretty much uh, you know uh, as normal as you would know, uh, during the MCO, even at the height of MCO. Uh, and, and I guess, you know, the opportunities were there. And, and I think this, again, on hindsight, this is something which, uh, you know, the digitization efforts have, uh, have borne fruit. Yeah, certainly. And we also see a lot of, a lot of corporate which are digitally na na native. They, I mean, they've been doing very well, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right, cool. I think moving on from a time check pers perspective, I think um, we are about 6 15 now. I will, I will probably wrap up this in, in five minutes' time and we will both potentially extend the session. I think we started to receive overwhelming questions. We probably uh -huh. will extend it for five to 10, 10 minutes more, allowing some of the members and candidates or some of our international guests from overseas can, can ask some of the que questions, right? I think. The fifth one is something that is something that is very close to the missions and the visions of CFA so society and, and institute, right? It's around accountability, all right? Yeah. So yeah. I think we look at some of the key highlights from last last year. I think we we have seen a lot in terms of the the average period of um, independent directors, um, the we, women participation rate, and to call out one specifically um, something that all of us are very interested in is about anti-corruption, risk, risk management, and kudos to BUSA and SC that all the PLC are required to have in place an anti-corruption risk management framework are required to conduct it at least once a year, right? So based on the accountability, some of these results that we have seen on the slide, Dato, um, are you happy with this result? And I mean, since we are in a way industry groups here, right? What, what would you like to see industry doing more? 
Well, um, you know, we are happy that the, our efforts have sort of, or the results have shown improvements from previous year. As you can see from the, the chart or the, the diagram on the screen, um, you know, this, all, all, all these uh, you know, numbers that have shown improvement since 2017 or in some cases 2015. And I think for us, uh, you know, board accountability is actually, uh, you know, the cornerstone principle of our corporate governance. And as you know, you know, corporate governance is also one of the key agenda for the SC in ensuring the, you know, integrity of the capital market. And uh, I think in this regard, um, you know, we have been putting in place some of the measures. And I think one of the most recent measures is actually just last week, we introduced uh, guidelines on conduct of directors uh, of listed issuer and the uh, subsidiaries. So uh, this uh, actually uh, enhances or sort of put more onus on the directors uh, to discharge their fiduciary duties as directors of uh, PLCs as well as subsidiaries of PLCs. Uh, we are of the view that you know, the, you know, the board of directors is ultimately responsible right, for the operations of uh, an entity and investors do rely on, uh, on directors, on the board of directors to uh, sort of protect or look after the, the welfare of the shareholders, including the minority shareholders. So the, in that regard, I suppose if you talk about improvement, yes, improvement. Are we happy? We're happy. It continues to show improvement, but I think there's still again a lot more that we can do. But you know, just to recap some of the progress that we've seen in a steady increase in terms of participation of women on board, as you can see, uh, back to 2019, um, you know, it's gone to, you know, approaching towards 25% from below 20% just uh, right. two years before that. And then we and, have... And the uh, goal is 30%, right, Dato? You got a 30% yes, club, right? Yeah, we have a 30% target. That's right. Mm. And uh, also in terms of the, the tenure of independent directors, uh, and some, some companies have actually limit, uh, you know, the, the tenure for the independent directors at nine years as prescribed in our Malaysian Code on Corporate Governance without, you know, with, without uh, seeking further extension for, for these independent directors. So mm -hmm. these are some of the, you know, some of the achievements. But uh, again, I suppose to go to the last part of your question, um, we, we will still encourage, we, you know, we continue to encourage uh, PLCs to enhance the, the governance practices as an, you know, sort of as a culture, right? Uh, we want them to see board accountability, uh, all this diversity on the board uh, and practices, governance practices as a culture that is built into the organization and not just as a political <laughs> exercise. And this is, a, of course, you know, a journey, but with, um, with the results that we are seeing, we are encouraged that more, um, PLCs are moving in this direction. In fact, for some of these areas, uh, in the small and mid-tier uh, companies are actually doing better than the large companies. For example, uh, voluntary disclosure of senior management uh, remuneration, right? uh, which again is uh, one part of, is in the MCCG. The, the mid to small cap companies are actually uh, you know, uh, doing better in this in on this front than the large caps. So uh, I think you know that there's again improvements uh, always there, uh, but we would uh, well also you know, continue to work closely with the industry. Right. Thanks for the insight, Dato. Um, if I could share a bit more in terms of what the industry from uh, the rest of the regulators are working on is MACC, we got a new amendment act, right? Session 17A, that, um, that if for individual who give out bribe, you can be jailed up to 20 years. Ben Agara has issued a concept paper around individual accountability, right? So in the past, um, board uh, are personally accountable by FSA Act, but not individual um, executive, right? So I think, I think 
Um, if I could summarize, you know, some of the this um, SDVO represented by that that dato as as well. I think we are moving to a more individual accountability, right? Um, we want the individual to be a bit more accountable to the actions yeah. that they do to the to the to the firms and the industry, right? That tie back to the last slide very closely around M enforcement, right? If you look at some of these statistics here in around the active case, around how many investors are implicated, I mean, it, it appears to me that we have more foster in the industry than before, right? Any any insight to to share some of the root causes and how is SE combating with this trend? Okay, well, I suppose. Uh... The numbers are quite fluctuating, uh, Justin. Uh, maybe I should clarify that. I think, yes, right. uh, for, for 2019, there was a slightly higher number overall in terms of cases that uh, the SC looked at compared Correct. to the previous year. Um, and I think, and also the, the nature of the, the cases also sort of fluctuate quite, quite a bit you know, from year to year. I mean, just picking up all the numbers that you can see on the screen, 25% uh, of the active cases here uh, relate to securities fraud. Um, whereas uh, in the previous five years, the average is between 3 and 14%, right? Um, but the actual number of overall, uh, you know, overall cases uh, beyond securities fraud had not increased as much. It's just that sometimes the proportion uh, changes, but having said that, uh, you know, uh, in terms of our enforcement uh, philosophy, I think what we try, what we want to ensure is there is uh, efficiency and transparency uh, in the process, uh, our enforcement process. Uh, with ultimate aim is really on the protection of investors, and uh, in this regard, I think it's, you know, that, that as as you may know, that the three sort of broad. Uh, actions that we can, the SE can take. One is, uh, you know, criminal, the other is civil, and the, the, the third one is uh, administrative action, depending on the nature of the breach or the, the you know, uh, violation. Uh, but what we do want to achieve is basically uh, out of these uh, actions, uh, one is the uh, important outcome is uh, deterrence, right? Whatever action that we take, what we hope to achieve is, uh, you know, it deter any future potential uh, um, you know, uh, offenders uh, mm. from committing a similar uh, offense or breach. Secondly, we want to restitute uh, those who have been unfairly uh, you know, uh, penalized, treated, uh, treated uh, who have lost uh, some of their life savings uh, because of you know, the, the, the work of some of these offenders. So these are some of the, I guess, you know, the, the overall philosophy in terms of us going through the, our enforcement action. Um, and, and in many cases, you know, sometimes it's not very, some of the, obviously when you want to take action, there needs to be you know, concrete evidence, uh, solid evidence for us to move forward. And this is not always, always available uh, easily. Sometimes, you know, we do have to take a bit of time to, uh, you know, to get the, the right evidence or, you know, for us to take further action. But in any case, uh, you know, I think one of the ways that we are hoping to address uh, so that we don't have as much enforcement cases is uh, in terms of investor empowerment, right, through our investor awareness campaigns. Uh, so you, you may be aware of our InvestSmart uh, initiative, for right. example. Uh, so mm -hmm. what we want to do is uh, we want the investors to also build up their awareness and understanding of their rights, of uh, you know, to be able to identify what are fraudulent schemes, um, what are not you know unreasonable type of returns, uh, so that they can also help themselves, uh, help protect themselves from falling prey to some of these uh, you know um, fraudsters or offenders. So. Uh, Investor awareness, uh, which we hope will lead to investor empowerment, is uh, also a key agenda for the SC. Sure, good, good. Um, I think that's with that. I think we come to the end. I think it's time. Um, and thanks all for the overwhelming query questions. There, there's actually quite a bit of questions for us to go through. Carry yeah, Justin, yep. uh, if I may fill the question. Uh, so that I think perhaps we could spend the next five, 10 minutes to try to address some of these key questions. There are some key themes um, that's been raised by our participants here. 
so firstly, um, uh, participants wanted to hear your views in terms of the current stock market, particularly the retail participation. Uh, what is your view on that and how sustainable um, you know, is the retail participation? Right, okay. Well, um, you know, we, we have seen record volumes uh, in, on, you know, traded on the, on Versa. I think this is, you know, from, from a market vibrancy perspective, obviously, you know, this is something which uh, is welcomed by many stakeholders uh, in, in the industry, in the capital market. But I think this also ties back to, you know, one of my earlier points that, uh, in the, the, there needs to be some uh, rational basis for you know, the, the actions or decisions that are taken. Um, of course, you know, some, some themes, um, uh, given the current sort of global context, you know, the, the health situation, the COVID situation, certain themes uh, are favored uh, more than others. Um, and, and therefore, you know, we can see, you know, prices of some of those that fit into these themes uh, perform very, very well. Uh, but at the same time, we do see, you know, some of the, uh, you know, smaller mid-cap counters also, uh, you know, performing well at high volumes. Uh, I would say that uh, perhaps, uh, to, I, I, you know, I wouldn't be able to, to say whether this is sustainable or not, um, but I think, uh, that there has been you know, the, um, a lot, there has been a lot of uh, think interest the, towards stock market investing again in the last few months into, into directly into stocks and i think uh, we need to ensure that uh, you know investors that participate uh, are well informed in terms of the decision making and and that uh, you know if they are advised by you know, investment advisors, investment advisors are also producing reports or, ad, or generating advice that uh, are based on you know rational uh, assumptions. Okay, um, Dato, the next question: um, How does SC view the digital or even the AI trading platform? Well, I, I suppose, um, you know, we, we did cover this a bit earlier on. Uh, I think we, you know, digitization, I think is, you know, movement towards it, more digitization is uh, almost a given, I would say. Uh, so the question is, how fast do we get there? And uh, what is the extent of the initiatives that we undertake uh, to facilitate more digitization within the capital market? Um, I think there was a bit of summary earlier in terms of some of the work that we have done in terms of ECI P2P platform, um, the, more recently the digital asset exchange. Um, now we've gone on, you know, seeking feedback on the digital asset wallet providers. So the, um, I think, and you know, the digital investment management uh, framework. So all these things uh, collectively, you know, we create the digital capital market ecosystem. Uh, but also in some cases, I think, you know, digital is a facilitator, uh, not not sort of the 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 end result. Uh, they facilitate, uh, you know, capital market activities or help provide more efficient solutions. So I guess you know we. We look at both as as being an in, integral part of capital market development, and we will actually uh, be, uh, you know, uh, try to create a facilitative environment by going back to our regulatory role. We also ensure that uh, whatever is undertaken uh, are, are done with proper controls and uh, regulatory within the re uh, a safe regulatory framework. Um, Dato, are there any roadmap or plans for ECF to facilitate secondary trading of shares issued on the platform moving forward? Uh, yes, I think we, we are already, I think, uh, in, in the midst of operationalizing that. Uh, so we will be, there will be secondary trading for, for ECF. Okay. And um, Dato, leveraging on digital uh, narration, right? I think one of the questions coming from Daniel Wong, I think is about how would SE deal with digital platform that don't respect 
um, physical boundary such as e eTolo. I I suppose this apply to some of the foreign exchange um, trade trading platform as 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 well, right? They are not they are not regulated or licensed by SC, mm -hmm. but Malaysian we can we can go on it and trade on trade, right? I think the question here is that um, from Daniel, it doesn't seem to make sense to ban them or discourage investor in you in using it. How do we deal with those situation? Well, for us, uh, you know, again, investor protection is uh, essential, right? Um, and we have frameworks, and we do require those who provide, uh, who undertake capital market activities uh, to get the necessary licenses to operate. Um, certainly, you know, in the digital space, it's quite difficult to, to sort of prevent or stop uh, some of these things from happening. But I think what the investors uh, should also know that, uh, you know, if they participate in or, you know, invest in some of these uh, platforms which are not regulated by the SC, uh, they may not be covered, uh, you know, from legally in terms of being able to get uh, restitution should there be any losses. Uh, or, and, and they may not actually also be able to uh, even you know, uh, have any, any access to some of these uh, platforms uh, from, a, from a legal standpoint. Sure. And, and, I, and I think not many investors are aware of that, right? Right. Yes. About, okay. Well, I, I think some are, some are aware, some are, may not be aware, but I, I guess you know, this is something which we have to continue uh, uh, you know, creating that, that awareness uh, yep. of the risk of investing or participating in schemes that are not regulated by the, by the SC. Sure. And I like the, the choice of word that you use, you use empowerment, right? It's about em con continue to empower those investor investors to make a, yes. a more informed decisions. Yes. Right? Yeah. I think we, you know, regulations can be there uh, in the end, but, but also if you know, the investors have to play their role as well in taking care of themselves. Okay. And that leading along, I think, um, I think one question from Jeff, Jeffrey Young, your, your old friend. <laughs> yeah. um, in facilitating development of domestic capital market, right? How can SE play a role in, in the development of young professional? Um, especially in the areas of technical skill, ethics, putting investor first, that's, that's, that's our attitudes and my, mindset. Yeah. Well, I, I suppose, uh, you know, uh, I suppose, you know, you may want me to say that CFA, take the CFA program. Uh, <laughs> there's a high level of, uh, you know, ethics component in the, in the CFA curriculum. But I think this is something which I suppose, you know, from a technical standpoint, uh, you know, the, the younger, I suppose, uh, you know, population need to also look at what are the options available and, and ask themselves what is their career objective, right, career plans. Um, going back to maybe, you know, related to your early que earlier question in, in terms of my motivation for taking the CFA exam, although uh, you know, at that time, it was something which was uh, required of me as an employee of, the, of that particular entity. Uh, the, but having gone through that, I, on hindsight, I would say, you know, uh, taking a program like this here uh, certainly uh, actually demonstrates the commitment and the discipline of the individual, right? Yep. Uh, and, and for those who are going to pursue a career in investment management, that is... Uh, you know, arguably the, the most relevant qualification to have. Uh, but even for those who are not going to pursue a direct career investment management, um, I think that the rigor of the CIFA program, and I'm sure in, in many of the other professional qualifications, uh, would ensure that, uh, you know, the candidates uh, who pursue these professional qualifications to actually undertake, uh, you know, the the commitment, the time commitment uh, to, to study um, and to make sure that they, they achieve the, or pass the, the qualification. So I think that is something which uh, you know, will help in terms of 
building talent coupled with ethics because uh, many of this uh, if not all of the professional uh, qualification also comes with annual declaration of you know ethics and and conduct right. uh, compliance with code of conduct and uh, you know that would certainly be one of the ways to build technical skills and also ensure uh, compliance with uh, good conduct and ethical behavior certainly certainly agree that that on on that um, I think I think we will take two more quiet questions and then we would con conclude the forum for today. Um, one question is about SE is perceived to be very pro progressive in promoting listed equity, right? Um, but I think the industry have not seen much pro progress in terms of listed bond and PDS market. Um, what is your what what is your view on on that? On listed bonds specifically. Listed uh, bond, private uh, debt, yeah. Well, I suppose on the listed bonds, I, I guess, uh, you know, it, it is uh, also a question of uh, supply and demand, right? Um, so a, a lot of the, I suppose, investors are still the large institutions who would go through OTC uh, to invest in, in uh, you know, in, in bonds in significant size in, in bond lots of the typical is a five million um, so there's still not that many investors who <clears throat> who go through you know for for listed uh, listed papers um, and I suppose you know there's also one as listed papers there's also I guess uh, uh, implication of or rather uh, you know implication that the, the, the retail investors are also participating but um, while you know you have retail investors uh, investing in fixed income uh, or bonds and suku but many of them go through the unit trust route right? yep yeah, so the demand is still you know from the larger investors or the fund managers um, and therefore you know the, the OTC market seems to be the more uh, sort of favored or preferred uh, platform for the trading of, of bonds uh, but if you look at the PDS market as a whole uh, I mean uh, not not the listed uh, part we are actually one of the larger private uh, you know uh, corporate bond market in the region uh, re relative to GDP we are probably I think the third largest uh, in terms of our bond market so we are, you know, actually developing the bond market quite well. Uh, but the, yes, the, you know, the listed uh, part of the bond market still needs some some work. And I guess, you know, the, uh, as as we attract more uh, medium-sized investors uh, to go into the into, into listed products, then you know, that work will still need to continue. Okay. Thanks, that Dato. Um, I think. The last question that maybe would like to ask here is that if you have a crystal ball in front of you, right? I do. Dato, <laughs> <laughs> when you look into 2021, right? Um, on the foresight, um, is there any potential risk of systemic failure, right? And if, if the answer is yes, what factors should we be looking into? From a capital market perspective, I assume. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, um, I think that's that's when you talk about systemic failure. I think you know it takes uh, you know a combination of uh, a few sort of adverse events happening together concurrently. Right? Yeah. Um, at the moment, you know, we've gone through you know this sort of period, uh, you know, of, of the last three or four months of uh, COVID. Uh, yes, you know there have been uh, impact on the economy, uh, on corporate earnings, uh, but we still see that you know the, you know now the, under the RMCO, uh, businesses are sort of operating again. But as I mentioned earlier, we do we need to look at corporate uh, the results, uh, you know, for second and third quarter. Um, we I suppose uh, you know looking at what you know the government is trying to do in terms of uh, ensuring you know the help is provided to those in real need of such help 
I think the, the idea here is really to prevent, you know, this systemic risk from happening. Um, so, um, so on the capital market side, uh, you know, we had also undertaken uh, stress tests uh, during the, the peak of the, the COVID, uh, you know, MCO period. And the market intermediaries have actually, uh, you know, uh, shown resilience, uh, even under the stress test scenarios. You will say, uh, you know, all the, you know, from the broking industry to our unit trust industry in terms of managing liquidity, mm. uh, even the PLCs, uh, you know, uh, by large, um, you know, um, they are all uh, in reasonably, uh, you know, good shape. Um, uh, and they are able to withstand, I think what we would deem to be quite uh, stressful scenarios that we uh, where we put the test, uh, put them through the, uh, such tests. Great. So, so everyone will be reassured on 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 that note, right? Uh, I think, um, I think with that, I think we come to the end of the forum for today. I think thanks all for tuning in, right, and join, joining the forum for to today. If you have any. Um, good ideas, right? And for CFA Society Malaysia to so all organize in terms of some of the speakers, some of the subject matter that you want us to dis discuss, feel feel free to write into us. I think we are happy to um, consider that, right? And thanks again, Dato and Security Commission's team for for supporting this great event. I wish all of you um, all the best and and continue to stay safe at at home. No. Thank you, Justin, and thank you, CFA Society, for hosting me. Thanks. Uh, thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Thank you, Dato. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.